Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Irving McPhail, President and CEO of the National Action Council for Minorities in Engineering. Founded in 1974, the Council envisions an engineering workforce that looks like America. Irving has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Irving, for joining us today. Great to be here. So this issue has been very much in the news recently, but it is a problem that is long-standing. How do you have an engineering workforce that doesn't look like America? How do we get to this state? Well, NACME's strategy, uh, going back now for decades, uh, has been to develop a comprehensive set of initiatives that are designed to really try to achieve our vision of an engineering workforce that looks like America. Uh, we are known primarily as a scholarship organization. Uh, we have been very successful in providing scholarship support for underrepresented minority students, developing relationships with a network of universities across the nation that are committed to increasing the diversity of their undergraduate, primarily engineering classes, and creating, uh, by virtue of our private sector funding and the interest of universities, a great public-private kind of partnership that has benefited a number of underrepresented minority students in the past four decades. Just to give you some metrics, we provided well over $124 million in scholarship support to more than 23,000 African American, Latino, and American Indian students. Not all of the 24,000 students have become engineers, but a significant percentage have. Uh, and so the scholarship support is very critical, particularly at this time with the escalating cost of higher education and the need to really provide some, some cushion and foundation for families, particularly first-generation college student families, to be able to really afford the cost of higher ed. But we also recognize that the scholarship support, as important as that is, is not sufficient. We've got to start a lot earlier. Uh, the reality is a lot of kids don't know what engineering is. Uh, they don't have an engineer in the family. There's not an engineer going to the local church. Uh, and so they really have no exposure uh, to engineering and to the excitement of innovation, invention, entrepreneurship. So we've started a number of initiatives beginning in middle school that are designed to really build awareness for young people, for parents, for school guidance counselors, uh, to kind of talk to kids in their language about uh, problem solving, uh, design, and innovation, and how they fit into that in some very interesting kinds of ways. And the STEM disciplines, engineering, of course, science, technology, engineering, and math, mm -hmm. those disciplines build on so many fundamentals. And, right. and particularly today, you add to that the requirement of having access to computing power, which is quite costly. So here you have the interaction not only of historic issues, of, of new immigrants having uh, not had access to education, or uh, people who have transgenerationally been disadvantaged in terms of access to, to education, but you also have the issue of skills that build on other skills that are not necessarily provided in uh, elementary, middle, and high schools. And you, you have the issue of, of wealth disparities that systematically disadvantage children who today can only pursue the, this type of study um, when they have access to the facilities. Exactly. So, so you, yeah. you're til you tilt the table systematically so that by the time your scholarships can even be enacted, um, people are already disadvantaged and they start from behind. How do you, how do you deal with that aspect? This is really the impetus behind our work in pre-engineering, uh, the effort to try to start as early as possible to try and resolve uh, a number of the issues and concerns that you've, that you've enumerated. Um, in addition to those, we are very concerned about the quality of math and science education generally in K-12, and particularly concerned about uh, the availability of qualified math and science teachers in schools that serve large numbers of underrepresented minority students. Uh, so beyond awareness, there also very critically is the issue of skills development. And, and class, that, class and that, ratios, right. because right. To, to teach these skills very often requires right. some very, very intensive training, but exactly. when the class sizes are so high. Exactly, yeah. It becomes a conundrum that basically gets in the way of really realizing our dream of diversity and equity in engineering, which is why we feel that NACME has to be engaged on multiple fronts. So when you come into communities, are you focused on, on particular geographies, particular school systems? Tactically, how do you take your ideas 
and your core programs and make sure that they're deployed? Well, let's start with scholarships. Uh, we have a network today of 51 universities. These universities are spread throughout the nation. Uh, these are universities that have made a commitment to diversity and equity in terms of engineering education. And so these are universities who come to us uh, in search of scholarship funding from NACME uh, that is made available to about half of the 51 universities in the form of block grants that the universities then use to recruit, enroll, educate, retain, and graduate increasing numbers of underrepresented minority students. The other half of the universities, our in-kind universities, do not receive dollars directly from NACME, mm -hmm. but they wish to be a part of the cause. They wish to identify with the NACME brand. And so they will identify from their own existing scholarship sources, you know, X number of scholarships that are named NACME scholarships. And beyond that, we make no distinction between in-kind or, or block grant. Booker Washington talked about how you measure a person by not the heights that they reach, but the, the distance they, the, that they travel. How do you measure success, of the success of your programs and the success of the people who, who are part of your scholarship program and your other programs? That's a great question. And again, I think that question has to be approached from multiple perspectives. Uh, some of the perspectives are fairly traditional, grade point average, six year, graduation rate, uh, five-year retention rate. Uh, we are a very research-oriented organization, uh, very program evaluation-centric. We collect a lot of data, crunch a lot of numbers, and really try to answer those questions. You're after results. Yeah, exactly. It results that can be documented and disseminated and shared with the perspective of trying to help stimulate a concern of best and promising practice. And you're creating a commitment, a mutual commitment with your counterparties, whether it is a student or whether it is exactly. an institution. You are also holding not only yourselves, but your counterparties accountable for those right. results. And that's a key point. The key thing that distinguishes NACME from a lot of the other organizations in the minority in engineering education space is the very point that you have made, the accountability. For example, at the scholarship level, we hold the universities accountable for the success of our students. We collect data on graduation rates and on GPAs. We're very proud that our NACME scholars, uh, as we dub our, our scholarship recipients, uh, have uh, numbers that are quite impressive. Uh, our students have a 3.2, 3.3 uh, grade point average on a 4.0 scale. Uh, I, we just completed a six year uh, graduation rate 79.1%. Uh, so we have students who are doing extremely well. They're diverse, they're highly motivated, and they also are achieving uh, outstanding academic outcomes. And very often climbing a, a very, very steep hill through oh, yeah. their own energy, through their own engagement. Exactly. Their contribution is, is, is stunning when, exactly. it, when, when it comes to the success of these, of these programs. And it, of course, right. it leads to their own success and the success of their families. Exactly, especially when you consider that most of our NACME scholars are first generation college students. Uh, they're not coming from wealthy homes where, you know, STEM education or these kinds of uh, prerequisites were, were, were natural parts of the, of the dinner conversation. Uh, these are kids that are coming from circumstances where they really have to work hard in order to close the gap. And with a lot of support from family, from NACME, from teachers, faculty, community, they're able to do that. And the great part of my job is being able to meet these students and really to just hear the stories. The stories are phenomenal uh, and really reflect uh, the value of hard work and persistence and resilience and the ability of an organization like NACME to provide some help. How many students have you affected over the last years? Uh, again, since we started four decades ago, we've supported with scholarships about 24,000 students. 24, Currently, 000. we support approximately 1,300 undergraduate students every year. 1,300? Yeah, every year. That's amazing. And yeah. then, in, uh, of course, that is leveraged through institutions, so you're affecting whole, stu whole communities. You're creating a different environment. When you think about the, the difference between an environment with those students and without those students, yeah. Um, you're, you're affecting a lot more people than the 24,000 
uh, young people who actually benefit directly right. from those scholarships. It, again, it sounds as if you, you really... Well, you're changing society. Right. It, it also sounds as if you really are an expert on our vision and our strategy <laughs> because what you've said is also something very important. Whereas we collect data on our NACME scholars, we also collect data on minority right. students who are not a part of the NACME Scholars Program, as well as majority students because we're constantly looking at the comparisons and at the leverage points. And you're right, what we're hoping is that our commitment to diversity and equity, the university's commitment to diversity and equity, really does change the culture of the engineering school, change the environment not only for underrepresented minority students, but for all students. And that really, ultimately, is the value of a diverse student body. And there's an aspect of this now that, that we also should talk about, which is once a, a young person has these foundational skills, they've, they've gone through these programs, they've benefited from the scholarships, they, they come out, they graduate, they celebrate with their family, what a joyous day. Right, right. Now, right. here's the real world, yes. uh, jobs. Yeah. Well, we're very fortunate to be supported today by a group of 35, uh, soon to be 36, major global engineering and technology companies. Um, you would have recognized the companies. Uh, these are the companies that are leading engineering and technology in the world. Feel free to give them credit. <laughs> God, my, you know, for example, I'll start with my executive committee companies. For example, uh, my chairman this year comes from Raytheon. Raytheon, major a defense contractor, uh, a company that has been very aggressive in terms of providing opportunities for NACME scholars as interns, as well as providing full-time opportunities for NACME scholars interested in mechanical aerospace. My, my vice chair uh, is a senior uh, executive at Hewlett Packard uh, and is leading an effort for NACME uh, related to Silicon Valley trying to increase uh, the opportunities for more NACME scholars to move into the computing disciplines uh, for the reasons that we talked about uh, earlier, uh, namely an opportunity to really uh, provide a leadership and support in an area of technology uh, where the needs uh, for talented uh, uh, computer specialists uh, are growing uh, rather rapidly. Um, you know, it, I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, uh, we, we, we have leadership from uh, major companies uh, that are providing opportunities for internships, full-time hires, uh, working very closely with our NACME scholars uh, to really make those kinds of uh, post-graduation plans and dreams and aspirations uh, really, really realized. And so it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity. In uh, the corner of the world where, where I live, um, there's been a lot of coverage recently in Silicon Valley of the, um, uh, of the male-dominated uh, aspects of the uh, of the professions there. Um, also, uh, while there there might be uh, uh, significant numbers of white uh, South Asian and East Asian uh, engineers, uh, one does not so often see African American, Hispanic, right. or Native American engineers. Talk about that aspect of of your work. Well, this is precisely the effort that is being led by Sue Barsamian, our Vice Chairman, uh, who is with Hewlett Packard, uh, colleagues at Hewlett Packard, uh, as well as supported by Bechtel uh, and several other uh, NACME board companies. Uh, the effort to try and get NACME in front of the leaders of major companies in Silicon Valley uh, to tell the NACME story, uh, to help uh, these companies uh, understand uh, at a very operational level that NACME can really be a part of the solution uh, to the conundrum that they face, uh, which is the need to diversify uh, the engineers and the talent, the scientific and technical talent uh, in their companies. And so we have a project uh, that has been dubbed Go West, again with the leadership of, of Hewlett Packard, uh, an investigative uh, study is currently underway, uh, just looking for opportunities, uh, looking for uh, where, where the data, where the information, where the opportunity really seems to be leading us. We're going to be evaluating a report uh, that's going to be coming to me probably at the end of April, uh, w which will suggest and make recommendations for how NACME uh, can, can really, in a, in a, in a robust way, uh, get engaged in helping to uh, resolve uh, the, the issue of the need to 
increase talent in the computing disciplines and to ensure uh, that that talent reflects the diversity of America. Uh, so again, uh, this is an area where NACME is very interested, very much engaged, and has board leadership uh, that is helping us to really determine how we might be able to intervene. The thing that I find so fascinating is how your board are active advocates. Exactly. How these business people are saying to their colleagues, look, it's in our interest. Right. You're our partners, you're our competitors, right. it's in your interest. This is right. our industry, it's in the industry's interest. This is actually important for our future, our survival. Exactly. And, and they become part of this, this ecosystem of, of that, that drives a change. Right. Now, how do, you, how do you define their roles beyond being employers and beyond being, being advocates and influencers? Are they advising you on how to shape your programs? Yeah. You, you've touched on it. Um, I like to think of the NACME Board of Directors uh, as having a number of important roles. I mean, clearly, financial support uh, is a major part of that role. They and would, they're your consultants. They're yeah, running that, major corporations, right, right. and they're, they are and your that, consultants. That's, that, in other words, there would be no NACME without the largesse, without the, the philanthropy, the passion, and the energy of the 35 companies that comprise the NACME Board of Directors. I should also add that we have a second group, the NACME Corporate Council, about 30 companies now, uh, not board companies, but companies that likewise are concerned and, and passionate about this and provide uh, support to us as well. But the second phase of it is the thought leadership. The thought leadership. The fact that I, as president and CEO of NACME, can have a conversation with a major C-suite executive of a global engineering and te technology company about issues and concerns that relate to diversity, that relate to how NACME might be able to position itself to aggressively uh, resolve what we call at NACME the new America dilemma. And those conversations are possible. What else can America do over the next years to assure that our workforce engages the talents of all of us. So the first thing I think we've got to do is really get people to be serious about the fact that we've got to do something. We've got to move the needle, we've got to increase the numbers, we've got to make opportunities available for kids who are now not participating equally in STEM education early on and, and provide the kind of motivation and support that helps to move them from point A uh, to point and A. And we have to and make the case, which you are so expertly making in your engagement of business leaders that diversity leads to creativity. Right. Diversity leads to product. Diversity leads to new solutions. Exactly. Diversity leads to profit. Right. Diversity leads to joy. Diversity is, is a strategic asset right. um, that so many others would wish that they could have a society in which diverse ideas, diverse peoples, diverse races, diverse religions, can together operate in a cooperative way. It is such a resource for us. It is what makes America great. Right. And that, you, you made my point. That's the power of the argument. But I think it's, it's, it's an argument that's got to be really better understood, I think, and accepted by many, many more people. Because we're not, we're not in this just to, to, to do something because it feels good doing it. I mean, we really are talking about the quality of life, being able to improve the quality of life for all of us by being able to have the best talent around the table. And that talent is diverse. Reverend McPhail, thank you so much for sharing the work of the National thank Action you. Council for Minorities in Engineering. And thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.